So my name is Diane Steele. I'm a groundwater technical specialist, a hydrogeologist in the, the Newcastle Groundwater Contaminated Land Team at the Environment Agency. So I've been sort of dealing with mineral sites uh, in our area for about 17 years now. So just sort of going to give you a bit of sort of an overview on sort of the abstraction licensing regime and how that's changed with regards to mineral developments. Prior to 2018, a lot of you are probably aware that abstraction licensing was not required for dewatering in, in mines and quarries, but that's no longer the case. So for the sort of previous couple of years, any activities that were taking place historically before the 1st of January 2018, you could apply for what we called a transitional new authorization license. And there was a two-year period of which you could apply. And we're sort of working our way through those applications now. They are all expected to be determined and with all the license granted by the end of 2022. And we are on track to do that. If you've got a new application, so you've got new dewatering activity that takes, has took place after 2018 or where there's been a change for what you did before 2018, then um, you need to um, apply for a license straight away. You can't go through the transitional regulations. And if you've already applied for a, a transitional license, then sort of if you inform us of the change that you're making, and then we will probably most likely pull it uh, from the list of uh, transitional and move it to, to be um, actioned now as what we call a day job, so a standard application. There's three different types of license that you can have. There's a full abstraction license. So we license anything where the daily rate of abstraction is over 20 cubic metres a day. If you take below that, then you don't need to apply for a license. You can do what you like with it under that amount. Um, so if you take from uh, what we call the source of supply, so a source of supply can be surface water, groundwater or tidal source. Uh, we don't, uh, the sea is not a source, so um, it's not licensable if you take from the sea. Um, so a full abstraction license is where it's used, where the water is going to be used for a subsequent use. So this is where like mineral washing, uh, dust suppression uh, or wheel washing, for example, you get what we call as protected rights. So basically we um, work out how much water is in that particular source or so how much water you can take out the river, how much water you can take out the ground um, that will not detrimentally impact it. Um, and basically, we will say that nobody else, we will not grant another license to anybody else for that same amount of water. You will basically have the right to that, to that water. Then we have transfer licenses. And this is where it goes from one to the source to the other. So it could go from groundwater to a river, for example, or it could go from one point of groundwater to another. And basically, you can't have any intervening use. So you can't take it from ground, then put it through a wheel wash, then straight to ground. That's classed as a use. So, But if you're just taking it straight from a sump to a surface water, that's a transfer license. With that, because it's anticipated that all the water is pretty much going to go back into the environment, then you don't get any protected rights. And somebody else can, in theory, take, be like, have a license to have that water. The other is a temporary license. And this is just where you're doing short term work so where you want to take the water for less than 28 days and that is a lot sort of simpler quicker process um it's more of a straightforward license with new applications we generally say that we have a sort of statutory responsibility to grant a license within four months of receiving an application there might be some pre-app work to do which would um escalate time skills, but yeah, once we receive a formal application, um, as long as the what we say is the, the amount of information is there that we require, then we will respond within four months. There might be a need if you're sort of next to a designated site or if you're going in through uh, coal workings, then there will be, we have a responsibility to consult Natural England and the or the coal authority as part of the application process. So it's recommended that if you sort of can anticipate that, that, um, that and start sort of engaging with them even before you put an application in, then normally it speeds up the process. The license that we grant at the minute are all time limited. Um, they are what we call um, given a time scale to the end of the catchment common end date. So every sort of water catchment across the country has basically got a date of which we will license. Um, they, if they, if the license 
is within six years of that date, then we will bump you to the next date, which will be 12 years after that. So the minimum duration you'll be given a license for is six years and generally the maximum will be 18 years. You, we do have a process where you can apply for a longer duration license, but there's various conditions on that. That is the process that's in place at the minute. Abstraction licensing from 2023 is moving into the environmental permitting regulations. And so it's expected that there won't be any time limits on, um, on licensing in the future for abstraction. Uh, what that'll mean is if you have, if you get granted a license today for either 16 or 18 years, then once that time limit ends, then you'll get a renewal. If you put in for renewal, then um, you'll move over to the, the new process from that date. We won't automatically change your uh, mid-license. We look to give consistent time scales for different licenses for the same site where possible, uh, just to keep things uh, straightforward and easy. Current costs, so for a temporary or a full abstraction licence, it's £135 application fee. For a transfer, it's 1500 The difference is, is that for a full abstraction uh, licence, although it's a lower fee upfront, then there's an annual subsistence fee, and that, um, that fee is dependent on the volume and the type of use. For the transfer licence, there's no annual cost. Um, it's all just upfront. I should note that they, we're currently reviewing our charges and we'll be going out to consultation in the summer of what they'll look like for the future. So, uh, if, you know, if you've got sort of a vested interest that you might want to have a look out for that consultation, charges are likely to change uh, from April 2022. So the process of uh, applying, um, so we're generally looking for a hydrological impact assessment or appraisal or a hydrological risk assessment, whichever you sort of note as. That's generally an assessment of the risks following the general source pathway receptor approach. So we would normally say that you should assess the risks associated with the maximum pumping rate that you need to maintain the safe operating level in the quarry. Generally, for any groundwater applications, we have a sort of a very standard pre-application process. You don't necessarily have to follow that for these type of sort of dewatering activities. The reason why you would maybe need one is if the, you want to have a look at aquifer parameters. So the pre-app process is where you would undertake a pump test. You would do sort of short-term pumping to see if there was any impact on any particular receptors. Or you would maybe look to try and find sort of aquifer properties such as sort of sort of flow paths or barriers or flow travel times in, in an aquifer. So that may or may not be required depending on site specifics. The key thing is to identify all potential receptors at risk and their location. In many of these cases, you might already have these risk assessment or site investigation reports produced for something like planning applications. So I would always recommend that uh, you maybe submit them as a good starter to minimise your effort and maybe just sort of update those if, if any sort of little changes have been made recently. Our approach is that we wouldn't really look to dual regulate where possible. I think ideally when these applications, sort of these activities came in through abstraction licensing, we thought that we would be able to sort of pull out of planning, recommending so many planning conditions. I think we are doing that slightly, but what we're trying to find is that the planning side is a lot more complex and the conditions are a lot more cover a lot more activities where they look at more like the general water management or water movement on the site rather than just specific to abstraction. So therefore, it's very difficult just to tease out the sort of specific activities that would mean that we, we wouldn't look to impose any sort of conditions at all with regards to abstraction on, on planning applications. And I think ideally, maybe we would like to get there in future, but it's just a sort of heads up that we it's it's not something that is sort of we're finding as easy to do. So the type of evidence that you would require for this risk assessment. So you would be looking for all water sources and their likely connectivity to groundwater. Generally, you would maybe sort of build a conceptual model. So this can be anything from simple cross section showing the location of where any water dependent features are, the type of geology, the general water levels, both within sort of the sort of surface water features, such as sort of reservoirs, ponds, reservoirs, lakes, where sort of springs were and any sort of knowledge of sort of flow paths or barriers, particularly if you're sort of in geology where it might be karstic or fractured. Uh, so maybe you're looking at receptors at a further distance away because the travel times are going to be much easier. What we're also finding actually is through looking at the sort of new, new authorizations applications is one of the best things is actually a simple water management plan or use of a sort of a schematic of what's sort of how the water's been transferred around the site. And I've got sort of a couple of sort of diagrams of what that sort of look like. They're really beneficial and sort of 
look at the sort of non-technical side. For numerical modeling, so if you've got sort of, uh, if it's tricky to get a lot of monitoring sites in or you can't access some of the receptors, for example, if you've got a number of uh, private water supply abstractors and people don't want you on the land, yes, you could, you know, you might be able to put a monitoring borehole along sort of the closest site boundary. But if that's not the case, it might be that you have to do some numerical modeling. Um, it might be the only way to determine the risk of derogating receptors if you've got limited information. What we sort of need to know is if you do do any numerical modeling, sort of what are the uncertainties? So what's the limitations of the data that you put into those models? You know, if you use generic aquifer properties, do you understand sort of the complexity of the geology? And what are the actually, there's always limited, limits in a numerical model. What are those? So it's all about, you know, if you've got a high risk site, then you would want, you know, more site specific data. Whereas if you've got sort of a low risk site, then you might be able to get more, get away with the using more sort of generic aquifer property determination, which you can get from sort of standard hydrogeology books. And also it can determine whether you need pumping tests to be undertaken. So it can determine whether you do have that level of information required. So for conceptual models, um, this is a little conceptual model that I drew yesterday. So it's just sort of give you an idea of how sort of simple something can be. So this is just show, you know, where you've got water levels in different receptors at the different sort of different um, some different uh, private water supplies where you've got sort of the spring and then sort of the quarry so you can draw on where where your water table is how it maybe is variable you could use if if you don't have any sort of site specific monitoring data you might be able to use that if uh, if any of the abstractors have got it to determine the difference between sort of their pumping activity to show sort of highs and lows in the water table so it can be just sort of a simple cross section, or these are two examples which have been submitted to us for applications. Uh, so the top one was for dewatering for for the construction of a flood scheme, which was sort of next to a river. Uh, so it was more important to get the difference of the geology layers between the sort of sand and gravel for the for when they were putting in the uh, the excavation. And then uh, sort of the larger one was actually for an open cast site and it was going into an aqua geology, which was sort of multi-layered. So it had different sandstone units and limestone units. So in that case, it was more about looking sort of widespread because it was sort of connecting to quite far away field because it, in the coal seams they've created pathways sort of longer pathways so you need to look more at a regional scale rather than an individual site specific scale but it's still quite a simple conceptual model but it all helped to understand like, where those, those risks were. So I said about water management plan and this is what we're sort of really finding really easy particularly for our permitting staff um, so it'd be good sort of to show where you've got the general water features on site where where pumps are located so where the water moves by or collects by gravity as opposed to where it's pumped between different sources sort of the flow the the direction of which the water is moved on site whether it has a subsequent use what we're generally finding is instead of giving abstraction licenses or transfer licenses for individual points, then we're giving it as for the whole operational area of the quarry. And this is to account so you don't have to keep varying um, a license as you maybe move three different phases or your benches or where you, you, you may move your sort of settlement lagoons or, your, you know, your ponds on site. So basically we would give one transfer license, for example, for everything within the red boundary on, on this site. What I've put is um, shown where you would maybe put meters and um, we want to sort of make your life easy. You're going to have to monitor um, sort of how much mo uh, water you take for the different activities, but you don't have to like sort of pepper your whole site with meters. So, if, you know, careful consideration of where you can sort of tease out the different volumes that you use for the different sources without like literally sort of, you can almost, if you plot it, you can maybe half the amount um, and get them in the right locations. Uh, some monitoring. So monitoring is often sort of one of the most important things for determining the risks. Then, you know, you would ideally want site-specific monitoring to occur. You would want to sort of look at seasonal trends and maybe sort of get at least a good year's worth of data prior to putting an application in. The duration of monitoring required it does vary from site to site, and it's very dependent on the level, uh, the type of scheme, the receptors, where they're located, sort of in high, how high risk the site is. There's often a greater requirement for monitoring um, evidence where you've got designated sites because you we normally have to have consultation with Natural England. They are very typically risk adverse in their strategy, whereas we're risk based. It's a small nuance, but uh, 
the lines of evidence that they require uh, are much higher uh, and we have to sort of listen to them for that. For licensed conditions, if monitoring points are fixed or you've got a, late, a long data record, then it might be that we just uh, that we have a license condition. If there's a need for long term monitoring, that we will put monitor water levels at this point or in phase X of the development. Um, but if you're gonna, if it's a really complex site where you're going to do multi phases and you're moving a water. Um, your both your monitoring points and your um, water features around the site and the point of where you maybe have your sump, then I would most likely recommend a, a bog standard sort of sort of generic condition saying that there's required for submission of a monitoring plan and annual data review. And within that, you can just change sort of repeatedly without having to need variations all the time to the license. And um, one other consideration is water quality and pollution. So even though that we're looking at the abstraction side, we do need to make sure that you're not going to cause pollution by any activities. And this could be the need to you know, consider whether there's a the potential to pull in pollution from a station site. And this would be both due in the operation and restoration stage. We're getting quite a lot of sites which, because they can't be filled, now there's not maybe enough inert waste and they're going to be sort of open water, then we have to sort of think about whether particularly, you know, you're going to get a lot of nitrate ingress or sort of sort of general pollution ingress from adjacent sites. And that's also after you walk away from the site. With regards to, there's also saline intrusion risks. So, you know, if you're next to the estuary or the sea, then dewatering, they can create a corner of depression that would bring in the seawater. Equally, if you do really deep excavations, then, you know, you, depending on where the site is, you might also be going below sea level. Uh, and so you would need to do that assessment of risk of whether you're going to pull, it, pull in that saline water. And it might be that we require a hands-off level uh, to say that you can't go below a certain level that would maybe encourage uh, saline water to come in. So this is just an example of some monitoring data that we submitted. So if you're doing sort of an assessment, then you can compare sort of, you know, you do a mini test to, to sort of pump it at, the, at a sump, see how some adjacent sort of ponds respond, and whether they have any corresponding response to, to the abstraction and also compare sort of the, the red uh, line at the bottom is the rainfall so you always want to make sure that you're you're understanding when the rainfall uh, events occur that you're making sure that your any interpretation takes account of rainfall rather than the on-site activities. Some of the considerations so uh, passive versus active dewatering so low risk passive dewatering does not require a license so if you if you're sort of doing dewatering which is by gravity so it's discharged from the ground and the influence of gravity, then there is a regulatory position statement, which as long as you can adhere to the few conditions that it specifies, then you won't need a license. This includes seepage faces associated with mineral cuttings. So we're only recently really looking to license active dewatering where water is pumped from a particular feature. So I've put a couple of examples here. So the first one doesn't require a license. So this is where you've just got general seepages either from the, the quarry face or coming up from the quarry floor. And then it flows through gravity to either a sump or a feature. And then the water isn't used for any subsequent use. That does not require a license. The second one is the same scenario, but then the water is taken from the receiving water feature, so from the pond, and is then used for something like mineral washing. That would require a license, and that was just for the sort of the second activity of the removing it for the mineral mineral washing. In the third case, it's the, basically the same in that it's uh, as the first one where uh, it's not used subsequently, but there is a. Um, a abstraction um, already in place or so private abstraction and basically then it, there may be a license required that if a simple assessment shows that there is potential risk of impact to that already existing uh, abstraction then a license would be required but if it's not going to impact it then a license would not be required. The other consideration is what we call wholly or mainly so we don't license rainwater. And so for any dewatering activity, you would need to determine whether the water that you are removing is either wholly or mainly groundwater. So this is basically a calculation of the proportion of groundwater and the total water that you have up, that you remove on site. So there's a couple of rules of thumb. So we basically say, is there less than 25% input from groundwater? If it's not, if you've got basically 75% rainwater in that sump, then it's not 
groundwater and therefore you don't need a license because it's not wholly or mainly. Does the level of the water in the excavation depend on water entering from the surrounding strata? So is it coming from the ground? If it's yes, then it's groundwater, so therefore it is wholly or mainly and requires a license. If it's perched, so if it's percolated into the ground and if it's sort of sitting in a perched aquifer above the, the excavation, but maybe a different geology, uh, but that's still groundwater, then yes, that's still wholly or mainly. So you would have to have a license for that. What we say is basically if it's less, if it's zero of 25 percent, uh, then a license application is not required. If it's over 75% of groundwater to rainwater, then you definitely do need a license. In the middle, it's all about looking at the lines of evidence to see what the data looks like, what the water balance is, and sort of looks to see sort of how reliant you are on that groundwater. What we have got a guidance document which has got uh, lots of these little pictures which I've produced on the bottom. I think there's about 10 of them uh, and it runs through the different scenarios so the first one is basically where the excavation is lined so therefore it's not reliant on groundwater it's not connected to the groundwater at all it's going to be all rainwater so therefore that wouldn't be require a license where the second one is the perch scenario so you're above the, the sort of groundwater in the in the base of the quarry, but there's also a perch aquifer, which is basically the source of it. So in that case, a license would be required. Practical licensing sort of considerations. The, it's often a quicker process if you want to sort of suggest conditions, particularly if you've already got planning in place, then you might want to sort of suggest some conditions that maybe will come out of what you are already doing under, under planning. Then if you've got short duration licences, then we'll probably more look to specific conditions. We have a whole raft of specific specific conditions that uh, cover sort of more, the majority of our sites. For longer duration licences and for, particularly for high risk sites, it might be more generic site specific conditions that we apply. Metering, you will have to monitor volumes for all abstraction licenses, and uh, it could be quite difficult to calculate if you've got multiple water sources. So, so early discussion on that is always advantageous. Um, as I said previously, you might require multiple meters to determine between each source. You can come up with a metering calculation table or a diagram to sort of show how you're going to work out uh, how much water you use on site. Protected rights. So as I said before, if you've got an abstraction license, uh, then you will get protected rights. There is a sort of a get around for this. So if um, if there's a possibility that you may pause, your activities may pose a risk to somebody who's got protected rights, then you could ask them whether they will sign the, that right away so that you can carry on with your activity. We have done this in a couple of cases because um, it might be that the other person who, that the, the sort of licensed person who's got that protected right might be also yourself or it could be sort of a, another quarrying company or it could be an industrial company who would maybe not as uh, disagreeable to sign that sort of the rights away than something like a, 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 like a private water or public water supply. Water source. So generally, we would only specify one rock formation or strata on um, on a license. So you'd normally say like chalk or or gravel, sort of or sand formations or limestone formations. And some we're finding some sites where they where they may be going have got different sources into different sources. So in that case, we would maybe go to the one where the most amount of water is coming from. And then yeah. For the water source, what I said before, which is that we would try and look to, to give your sources the whole excavation area if you're going to be moving your abstraction. But um, the point of which we can you can apply for a, a license that covers uh, a particular point, a reach. So from one so some could be like from a river from one, one point to the other or an area. So a polygon uh, feature. Other sort of things that are uh, considered outside of the abstraction licensing is sort of discharges. So a full abstraction or a transfer license doesn't take away the need for a discharge permit for ones required. So if you're going to sort of discharge the to surface water or the ground, then you may also need a permit. What we sort of ideally would like is that the water is returned to the same uh, source if possible, just to protect that resource for other people. And so if you take from the ground, ideally you would like it to go to the ground and also to the to the same formation. We know that that's not always possible and many of the sites go to surface water. If it goes to ground, then it needs to be classed as clean. It shouldn't have any sediment in and that's the surface water as well. 
And if it is potentially of poor quality or poorer quality, then you shouldn't be cross-connecting aquifers of different qualities. So you shouldn't be putting sort of discharge into a, a, a groundwater supply that is of better quality than the one that you're taking from. There is one exemption for discharges to surface water, but it's only for short-term discharges of less than uh, three consecutive months. Um, but that is there. So if you're only doing sort of short-term uh, dewatering, so say you may have to sort of be uh, reopening a site and you want to sort of take out all of the water that's built up over time, then you could possibly do that under under the, the short the temporary dewatering from excavations regulatory position statement. So and the other consideration that I put is about flood risk. So we're seeing an increased um, requirement for um, flood risk assessments to be produced as part of new or extension applications, particularly within an environmental impact assessment and within those we need to really consider the, the risk from groundwater so this would be where there's a change of infiltration from just removing potentially sort of uh, superficial deposits in sort of in, and uh, whether there's going to be increased infiltration into the ground um, and that's through sort of either rainfall and or any sort of dewatering or water movement around the site and whether that's going to cause a, an increased risk of, of downstream flood risk. So that's something that I just thought I would put in because we are seeing increased uh, for those assessments to be required. And that's it. So there's various guidance available on gov.uk. So we have a guidance document that basically uh, it's a very long document which goes through uh, all this sort of technical assessments for producing a hydrological impact assessment. It's very good documents. So that's on gov.uk. All the standard abstraction license forms are there. And then there's information on the two sort of regulate reposition statements, one on the low risk passive weight dewatering and one on the temporary dewatering from excavations. They're all on there with the, the few conditions that you would need to meet, which means that you would not require a license or a permit to uh, to do those activities. And that's it. That's me. Thank you, Dan. Over to Clive for part two. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Clive Carpenter. I am a partner at GWP Consultants who many of you will know, or you have been consultants to the extractive industry for more years than I care to remember, probably. I lead the water team there. I'm a chartered geologist and hydrogeologist, uh, and I have uh, more than 30 years of experience working in the extractive industry in, in water management, including groundwater. I've been asked to speak to you today on some operational perspectives of the impacts of the changes to the abstraction licensing regime, particularly with a view to new mineral permits, uh, new mineral permissions, and what that might mean in terms of water quality monitoring requirements and systems for those discharge, uh, the dewatering discharge. For those of you who are down in the southwest, that little picture in the middle is of Venn Quarry, which is actually restored mostly, um, and this has some particular and um, very unusual abstraction discharge requirements because of the nature of the strata there but um, uh, it's very specific so I'm not going to use it as, as an example but it's a, it's a nice shot on a cold day. So briefly an outline so you know where I'm going some, just some comments on the dewatering abstraction license process which uh, Diane has, uh, has addressed mostly uh, already what this might mean in terms of new planning and permitting considerations compared to what was required before what you need to do in terms of the evidence base you need to put together. Again, Diane touched on this, but this leads me on to later parts of the presentation. Ways and avoiding of avoiding and reducing your groundwater dewatering requirements, uh, which is all to do with quarry design optimization, some operational considerations, and then lastly finishing off with existing practices and perhaps some best practices in discharge monitoring. So, as Anne has already said, there is now a requirement for you to get an abstraction license for the dewatering of groundwater. And as she's pointed out, this is not required for rainwater. It's been a long process in coming about. Uh, 2003 was when the Act came into, came into being, but uh, only in 2018 did this start to become a reality. And as many of you will know, you would have put in applications as part of the transitional arrangements which enabled existing dewatering activities to be moved uh, into the new regulatory regime. The determination period is two to three years, although of course this was pre-COVID 
and although obviously we don't keep a, a regular contact on our clients in terms of when they receive their licenses, I'm not aware of, of many having received them at this point in time. But the important thing is that all new sites will require abstraction licenses and perhaps of most relevance to many of yourselves is that if you change your dewatering requirements on a site beyond that which you have already applied for, you are going to need a new abstraction license. So whether that's an extent, a lateral extension or whether that's a vertical deepening, you will require an abstraction license. And as Diane said, um, if that's going to be on a site that is still currently going through determination, then they will pull it from one process and put it into the other, although that might actually be quicker. And said so it takes four months or so their side to um, to assess an application. So I would suggest as a minimum, you're talking six to nine months. Um, and that's not including any detailed baseline um, um, groundwater monitoring assessments. So it's it's a significant period of time and you obviously don't want to get to a point where you are sitting at the water table and then you've got to down tall. So this does definitely take some some serious planning. So new planning and permitting considerations. Well, from a planning point of view, actually, I don't think things are particularly materially different from the last decade, maybe even the last two decades. Groundwater dewatering has always, at least in the recent past, been captured within the environmental impact assessment process. And the EA has always required groundwater to be assessed as part of that impact assessment. Uh, and as such, um, much of what you need to do, many of you will already be doing as part of your existing baselining and pre-planning application work. The EA has used the planning process to object and prevent dewatering impact from happening because it was the only mechanism it had to do that. So all of this work that you have done at planning will now be directly relevant to permitting. I think Diane commented on the issue of double regulation, but for now, you're going to have to go through both, um, but that work will have, I guess, twice the value. So from permitting, as you said, uh, dewatering, groundwater abstraction has not been covered by permitting before. The site or the discharge was and still is covered by permitting, but it very much focuses on the impact of the receiving water, not the one from which you've been taking the water. And of course, these may not be necessarily in hydraulic continuity or connectivity with each other, and they may not even be even in close proximity. So the groundwater work required for planning now you, know, you can you will now be also using to secure your permit some some observations perhaps not on the transitional period but more generally is that i would say that securing planning is becoming progressively more difficult and there's a variety of reasons for this one is perhaps that the easiest sites have been selected and brought into development leaving the perhaps the trickier ones uh, to be available going forward Inevitably, the environmental legislation is getting tighter year on year, and that uh, I suppose the groundwater abstraction being an example of that. And there is a growing recognition of increasing aridity, a reduction in water availability, and therefore a more rigorous requirement to assess uh, the, uh, the impacts on the water environment, but also the use of, of water. Um, Local stakeholders are becoming more empowered, whether that's because of the internet or, or civil society engagement more generally, and of which I'm sure you're, you're all more than aware. And so this does mean that it is increasingly challenging. And this means that more often than not, you will need baseline pre-development monitoring in place. And if I can give you one take-home message, it is please get this done and get it done as early as possible. It's going to save considerable challenges in the planning and permitting process to follow. Typically, you're going to need two years of data. Sometimes uh, it's possible to, to get planning applications through with less data than that, but normally it's because either the site is uh, 
considered to be low risk or because there are other data sets which you are able to tap into, such as the Environment Agency's own um, archives uh, and, and monitoring systems. And that's always a good place, of course, to, to, um, to secure much longer term data sets. So the evidence base that you need, and again, like Diane touched on this, this all comes down to risk. And Diane talked about them, the EA being um, risk evidence based. So the amount of effort required in order to get your new planning and permitting is driven by the, the risk of impact to the receptor and the vulnerability of that receptor. And we call this in a very simple way, we call this a source pathway receptor model. And I mean, this is something you're familiar with, I apologize, but for those of you who are not, the source is the activity causing the impact. So the dewatering activity in this case, which is obviously determined by the area you want to dewater, the depth you want to dewater and the duration. The receptor is the user of the groundwater, which may be an individual, a business, so boreholes, wells, springs, but it could be an ecosystem, so a wetland or a watercourse. And some of those, of course, will be more vulnerable than others. Those that are taking water for possible reasons, um, as in drinking water, you know, are likely to um, require more assessment than those that are not. Uh, and of course, there's different amounts of value placed upon what that water is being used for. And wetlands and, ecos and ecosystems themselves have different levels of uh, importance and significance. So the pathway is the hydraulic connection between the source and the receptor. Um, so a uh, permeable aquifer unit and is a function of that material, how permeable is, but also of course distance. So the evidence, the evidence base, well, we, we use um, public domain data that's available, which includes geological mapping and the public domain borehole archives. Of course, we will um, add to that your own ground investigation work that, um, that will exist, as well as former IGS reports on, on mineral mapping and so on. We'll use public domain data searches to get an initial understanding of what receptors might exist. So this includes the Environment Agency for License Abstractions, the Environmental Health Officers of the local councils for private abstractions. Many of you will be familiar with the MAGIC website, which uh, enables us to identify wetlands and landfills and these types of things, as well as, of course, natural England. So this enables us to start to get an understanding of, of the source pathway receptor relationship for the site. And then what will happen is that you'll be asked to undertake a water features survey. Uh, I think Diane alluded to the fact that early engagement with the EA is really very uh, important. And obviously many of you will be familiar of the scoping opinion and scoping response environmental planning process which would flag up these kinds of issues and concerns. So the water features survey is essentially a walkover survey within a defined radius of the, of the site. Obviously the radius depends somewhat on the nature of the abstraction, how large it is, how deep it will go. And we have to visit, the, we identify from those domain searches as well as from the scoping opinions, boreholes, wells, springs, ditches, watercourses that could be derogated as a result of the dewatering. And typically we will undertake interviews with those owners. And during that survey period, we will undertake one-off water level flow, water quality measuring as and sampling as well. And this will lead us to a point where we may then start to advise you uh, about requirements for uh, additional uh, additional monitoring, uh, in particular, if the risk is considered sufficient that you are likely to require baseline monitoring of the groundwater conditions and an understanding of their seasonality. So installation of pisometers around the site is uh, uh, will be recommended at almost all sites these days. The 
other aspect that you are likely to need to monitor, um, and this will be, of course, more typically for those sites where you're, which are planning to be extended or deepened, is to get a robust understanding of the pumping scheme on the site and to undertake monitoring of that, which will include needing to understand the flow rates at which you're pumping and the head lift, you know, the, uh, the vertical lift that you uh, need to achieve um, to get that the water out of the out of the quarry, and again, I, I flag these in red so that you um, you take these away as uh, as key points. Again, Diane has mentioned that there can be a requirement for more detailed investigation and assessment, which could include pumping tests and sometimes will include numerical modelling. But the justification for that will be based upon the amount of impact, so the source and the uh, conceptual understanding of the vulnerability of the receptors. Increasingly, with numerical modelling becoming uh, easier to do, with computing becoming more, um, more powerful, there is a tendency to go to, towards this approach uh, more and more, but like all models, they are only driven on the quality of the data they have. So, groundwater, water, groundwater dewatering, can be a challenge and it's not always necessary to actually undertake it. So there are ways to avoid it and there are ways to reduce it. And I put up three examples here on this slide. The third is a common sense, of course, but it's to limit the excavation to the above, to above the groundwater table, which of course means that you need to understand where that groundwater table is. So that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be monitoring. And the optimal way to do this to maximise the, um, the excavation of mineral is to use seasonal benches, which of course many of you will be familiar with, but for the benefit of those who are not, what we mean by this is uh, in rock strata where you have a significant variation in groundwater level in the seasons. So this will typically be rocks with low storage, such as chalk and limestones, then you will have a seasonal groundwater level may vary depending how close you are to rivers of five meters or more, sometimes 20 meters in some, um, in some environments, which means that you're starting to talk about groundwater variation, which is akin to the heights of benches. So this means that uh, if you know what the groundwater is doing, that in the summer when the groundwater falls, you can take you can excavate above the groundwater table in deep benches and then when the groundwater starts to re re uh, rebound during the um, during the, the autumn and the winter months then you can mine shallower benches uh, which you've obviously um, retained for that purpose. Obviously this won't work on all sites but it does give you flexibility assuming that the raw mineral is appropriate and, uh, and you have the footprint to do it. The second approach is to use wet excavation, where, of course, you are deliberately working below the groundwater table, but you're not dewatering. This obviously works best in those strata which don't require a huge amount of uh, breakout, so unconsolidated granular materials, minerals, sands and gravels usually works best, and ideally where they're fairly uniform because, obviously, you can't see the base of the mineral easily, although you'll obviously have ground investigation or mineral investigation to guide you. Equipment, of course, is becoming increasingly powerful. Long-reach backhoes can reach about you know, 12 metres or more, although more typically uh, six metres. And this is this is often practised in, um, in river terrace gravels. There are, of course, issues to be aware of, which I won't go into any detail, but clearly issues of stability and undercutting of excavators on mineral is something to be avoided. Lastly, you, you can try and separate the site from the surrounding aquifer, and this is increasingly undertaken, especially in sand and gravel sites which are underlain by clay bedrock. And the approach is to essentially create a cutoff around either the excavation of the individual pits or around the entire site, which is a technique known as picture framing can be known as picture framing and essentially what you do is you you excavate a box slot around the perimeter of the site 
uh, you remove that mineral. Clearly, you are going below the water table, so you're, it's a wet excavation box slot. And then you overdig and you, you uh, excavate um, sufficient amount of the clay beneath. And then you place that up against the external pit faces in a, in a uh, non-engineered uh, wall. And this then enables you to effectively create a sealed interior, which is not in hydraulic connectivity with the surrounding aquifer. And then what's inside can then be removed without, in terms of water, can be removed without a groundwater extraction license. Many of these sites will then be restored through imported material and landfilling, and many of them will therefore require an engineered sidewall liner, which is, can then be placed against that external unlined seal, sorry, unengineered seal. And so therefore, in fact, the impact of the cutoffs around the site is no different to the restored site, which is an impact relating to groundwater flow truncation, which can usually be readily mitigated with the use of groundwater flow interception trenches or drains around and outside the uh, outside of the cutoff, but when they're within the perimeter of the site to move the water from upgrading to downgrading. So there are ways and means in, within certain constraints of avoiding groundwater dewatering altogether. Some operational considerations, obviously, groundwater monitoring boreholes are part and parcel of both the planning, permitting, and compliance of operating these sites. Protecting these boreholes is important, and the best way to protect them is to put them somewhere sensible. So locations is the key issue, and bear this in mind in terms of both the future design and phasing, so that ideally you're not going to lose them and have to pay to have them uh, put back in somewhere else. Obviously, the use of on-site minerals over burden rock boulders is ideal for protection, especially with large plant uh, uh, Wooden fence isn't really going to do the job. But if you expect to lose them because of the phasing, then plan for this so that you can get the drilling of replacements put in you know, in good, good time. Monitoring pumping rates. I would say that this is probably the most poorly done aspect of monitoring on most of the sites. And there has been a lack of monitoring, certainly pre-2018, 2019. I mean, there are good reasons for this not least of which it wasn't required for extraction, but it probably was required for discharge. And the most obvious of which is that a lot of the water that's coming out of the pit is obviously turbid, and that turbidity damages conventional flow meters. Flow meters, as you're probably aware, usually have some kind of small impeller, which is like a propeller that sits inside an online flow meter, which is bolted into the discharge main. And as a result, they take a hammering from the um, from the sediment that passes through them. There are other approaches. Fixed baffle tanks are with weirs, and they are increasingly coming onto the market, some mobile clamp-on flow meters, which don't use internal impellers. And I'll show you some examples of this in a minute. But the other things you need to do as well, however, is you do need to monitor your sump water levels. And there are two reasons for that. Obviously, this can be done manually with gauge boards and or you can put data loggers into, uh, into stilling wells as well to, um, to ensure that you are getting a, a more detailed monitoring uh, um, uh, data series. One of the reasons it's important is that you may well find that you are, your pumping is uh, partly... A, Pumping rate is partly a function of the lift, which is simply from the water level that you're pumping from to the discharge location. And that that's going to change depending on the amount of surface water also entering into the site. So you may find that you are, your pumping rates don't link terribly closely to rainfall if you're allowing water levels to rise and fall in the sump. So it's helpful to understand what that was happening with your sump water levels. And it's also helpful to know what obviously what geometry of your sump is. Um, so regular topographic surveying is uh, is important as well of the of the sumps in particular. Diane touched on this, but it may also be necessary to separate your groundwater abstraction 
activities from other pumping around the site, especially if there's surface water being mixed with it, and especially if you're returning water from uh, from the processing plant as well, then you, what you don't want to end up doing is double double accounting water that's flowing around the site. So you may have a requirement for several sets of flow meters in the site. And lastly, monitoring rainfall. This also almost never happens. I mean, we do have a good density of rainfall gauges in this country, but especially if you're going to be relying on a rainfall exemption, so trying to get uh, the permission through by relying on the fact that you are pumping less than 25% groundwater, it really would be appropriate to have a range and gauge as close to the site. There are a few things that you always need to do, such as ensure that you're not too near a building or that there's overhanging vegetation and you don't obviously want them to get knocked over. So sticking them somewhere near the, in the compound area of the site is ideal. And then, of course, there are many types, um, manual and automated. Uh, and obviously, the benefit of the automated gauges is much better greater density of data but of course they come with the cost some further considerations it's possible that it possible separation of uh, the ground discharge from the surface water has some advantages of course it's not always possible or practicable to do that it depends how you're dewatering the quarry the surface water discharge rate from the site will, will be controlled by the greenfield runoff rate and there are some changes in how the greenfield runoff rate is constrained under the under the regulatory regime for most of the last two decades or longer it's been limited on peak flow the maximum amount you can remove increasingly total flow is also now being considered so if you are pumping groundwater and surface water then there is every likelihood that your total flow will exceed the green, will mean you could exceed the greenfield runoff rate. So this, whilst it may not be practical to separate two out, it will be important to try and get an understanding of your groundwater man, of your water management within your site. And the groundwater dewatering rate, which is the abstraction rate, is likely to be entirely different from the greenfield runoff rate and therefore the surface water discharge. So something to be mindful of. You certainly would, should try and keep your groundwater abstraction separate from your processing effluent discharge, um, such as uh, water leaving the, the wash plant. I mean, admittedly, these are usually closed systems, but that's not always the case. And the reason for that, obviously, is that you will get elevated concentrations from the wash plant, certainly stability, but you may get some other things in there as well flocculants being the most obvious example, which the um, agency um, may well have some concerns about. So again, some, it's, uh, it's ideal to try and keep them separate, although they're not always practicable. The last thing you should be aware of um, relating to the groundwater abstraction is that if you are near a site that is polluted, there is the possibility that you are going to start to pull pollutant onto the site. Primitive boreholes are an important part of your armory for understanding whether you're getting pollutants coming onto the site and for detecting this, but in all likelihood, you will still be held responsible for the treatment of that water from your site. So treatment of groundwater that has been extracted will be necessary if it contains things which will breach environmental quality standards in the receiving water calls. Discharge quantity monitoring, a few examples of different types of approaches. The most conventional approach, but not used that widely in the coring industry because of problems with impeller damage from turbidity. Conventional online flow meters. And this is an example that you see uh, here on a 12 inch rising main. The flow is going from left to right although maybe it's not obvious in this picture, the ground rises to the right. This is a really important point, actually, because the flow meter, the, the pipe has to be fully flowing full bore if this flow meter is going to be reading accurately. If you have it so that it's flowing downhill, so you put it perhaps once you've got the water getting over the crest of your perimeter bund and you put a flow meter on the downward side, it won't be flowing full bore and it will overread. So it's important that you have a fully 
fully flooded pipe when you're reading. They tend to be accumulators, meaning that they have a dial going around and around and it picks up the total reading and for each day. And many of you will be familiar with these when you take manual readings and write them down daily, weekly, monthly, what have you. Of course, they need recalibration and this is not something which is often done and it's increasingly important that you do calibrate these meters, recalibrate these meters and that you have spares while you're doing that, otherwise you won't be pumping, or at least you won't be pumping and, and flow metering at the same time. And increasingly you can get data loggers on these, and this is actually what this is here under this rain hood. This is in Malaysia and uh, rather a rainfall, and this data logger is monitoring every five minutes, gives it a robust data set. There is increasingly on the market a new type of flow meter, which is called a clamp on flow meter. And these have some advantages. Essentially, it measures, it uses ultra ultrasonics to measure acoustics inside the pipes between two different straps here. Obviously, these are set at different distances apart. It has the advantage that you can use it at multiple locations on a site and multiple sites, I suppose. They're not they're not terribly cheap, but they, they don't get damaged by turbidity and they're less likely to require replacement. They do provide you with instantaneous readings and they are best deployed when used with data loggers, which is what you see here. Of course, these need a power source, so that needs to be um, borne in mind. But as I said, they don't get damaged, um, so they, they do have a greater robustness in that sense. I mentioned a V-notch weir baffle tank, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This is quite a small one. Obviously, the water comes out into the tank, and then it is calmed down through the baffles, and then it goes over this V-notch, um, the depth of water that goes over that V notch there has a specific mathematical relationship to the uh, to the geometry of that V notch, and so by measuring that the, the depth of the water over that notch, you then get um you then get a flow. You can measure it manually, um, or you can install a pressure tran transducer into the tank, and then you'll get a continuous measurement. One of the other advantages of baffle tanks, of course, is that you can take water samples easily and increasingly companies are installing water quality probes into these tanks because there's a continuous turnover of water. Um, they're obviously fixed in location, but they are a robust way of measuring abstraction volume. Increasingly, the tanks are becoming more uh, complex and more flexible, so uh, it's not uncommon to also see an overflow weir going into another compartment, and then that compartment will have an appropriate plumbing to enable you to put a flow meter on it as well. So, so there's an opportunity to have both you know, two different systems recording flow, which of course provides a much greater level of robustness. Some water levels, I'm not sure if many of you will have seen these. This is a manual manual reading gauge. And uh, this is actually a pipe, a standpipe, which you'll have slotted and has a transducer sitting in it. So this is an example of both a, a manual and an automated sump water level measuring system. As I mentioned earlier, you know, you, when you're measuring sump water level, you do also need to, from time to time, you know, resurvey your sump geometry perhaps because of sedimentation, but obviously from time to time you'll be moving your sumps around or you'll be deepening the uh, the pit and the level is only telling you one of the, the dimensions that you need to work out the volume of your sump. We have, to our knowledge, been successful in getting an exemption from an abstraction licence requirement for one quarry where it was pumping a lot of water over a two-year period two-year period immediately before the consideration of the transitional period. But when we looked at the rainfall into this particular quarry and we looked at the sump water level data and the sump geometry, um, it became clear that in fact, essentially what had happened was that there had been some extremely wet years and a lack of pumping. And then subsequent years where there was pumping to bring the water levels down, but it could be entirely accounted for by a rainwater balance but only if multiple years were taken into account and only if the sump water level data existed, which it did, and could be coupled with, with three, a 3D um, geometric evaluation of the sump volume. So these things can be, can be important. 
And then to finish off, a couple of slides on discharge quality monitoring. Uh, the vast majority of you, I'm sure, will just use a sample on laboratory testing um, approach, which is entirely valid and, of course, has the advantage. I mean, each of these approaches has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage, of course, is that you can me measure for any and all determinants and you can possibly think of. Usually the labs will provide bespoke bottles for you, um, so you don't need to worry about issues of contamination and, pres and sample preservation. And you sample and send, and there is normally good QC for form filling in for, um, for, the, for the transfer of custody of those, um, those samples. You don't require, it doesn't require any calibration. Uh, but you know, are there, there are always water safety considerations in terms of working near water, and it's not always easy to get a water sample from a discharge that's going, say, into a river. So you know, there are always some issues. Possible handheld probes, an example is you see there, which is probably two, so it's probably temperature and pH, or it might be pH and conductivity. It's very, very valuable and useful piece of equipment. They do have a limited number of determinants normally, especially this kind of type, you know, pH, temperature, conductivity, perhaps stability in dissolved oxygen. They do, of course, require routine calibration, um, but they can be used on multiple sites and in multiple locations. And they do provide you with obviously a non-continuous measurement, but it does enable your staff to, to monitor more frequently than sending continuous lab samples. And if your discharge consent is limited to turbidity and perhaps pH, and then visual observations of oils and things like that, um, this may be entirely yeah, fit for purpose. Installed probes, I mentioned that this is becoming more common in terms of placement in discharge tanks. And these are having an increasing amount of capacity and technology. They're obviously not necessarily that cheap, but a lot of them were originally designed for monitoring wastewater processing and wastewater um, treatment and industrial effluents. So have been developed to look at obviously pH stability, temperature, dissolved oxygen and pressure, but also increasingly biological oxygen demand, chemical oxygen demand, total organic carbon, coliforms, chloride, nitrate, ammonia and oils, many of, thing, of which are things which you won't be interested in just from a quarrying point of view, but many of you will also be uh, simultaneously backfilling um, uh, quarries with waste. So um, this is a technology that is becoming increasingly available. Of course, they require calibration and for such devices, those, that normally means going back to the manufacturer you'll tend to, to deploy them in fixed locations, although of course they could be moved about from place to place and they can be deployed with data loggers and provide really robust monitoring of water quality parameters that you require. They are available for sale and for hire. So, you know, there's a variety of approaches that you can take. And best practice, well, I think a combination of, of the three different approaches, again, it depends, depends on risk. Um, concerns about local receptors. Obviously, with installed probes, these data loggers can have warning levels set on them for alarms, which which obviously enable your staff to be aware of imminent breaches if you set your trigger levels below your consent limits. They can be linked through telemetry to site offices and, uh, and, and as well as data downloads, enabling staff on even you know, not on the sites necessarily to be aware of encroaching problems. It's easy to get these to now be visualized on web-based portals, and that may be important both internally, but also may help with um, demonstrating to uh, local stakeholders and others that, that you are not breaching your limits. So there is an increasing technology available. Of course, it comes with a cost, but it also comes with a reduction perhaps in staffing, uh, an increased robustness, improving your compliance. And I think that is the end for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clive. Any questions? I have one through the chat uh, for Diane from Steve Cole. Uh, new regulations are clearly adding to the complexity, complexity of applications. There is a history of long delays with the EA reporting back as part of the planning process. Usually lack of resources given as a reason. Are there any plans to improve response time? What can applicants do to assist in speeding up the process? 
resource is a continued issue um, and has, I would say, in the last year got worse. Uh, um, with regards to um, the biggest delay, the biggest delay is about having to go to and fro, uh, going backwards and forwards. Um, so I think the, 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 I would say that the best way is trying to get everything up front. Um, certainly on the abstraction side, when you do um, at the minute until uh, 2023, um, all the abstraction sort of pre-app side is done by an area rather than by our permitting service. And um, it's a, you know, if you speak to a local person and therefore it's a, um, the, the time scales to turn around for that is a lot generally quicker than our permitting service. Um, and so I would say do as much as you can upfront um, and be prepared and also supply and speak earliest to the local people rather than the permitting service. Because once you get into the sort of the formal permitting, then that's where the process resolves. But I don't think there is a, a, a sort of easier answer. Um, I know that certainly for the applications that um, for, for your transitional ones, we, we definitely are on track for them. Um, so uh, that's one thing that this has been prioritised um, for those. Uh, they're being done in turn by catchment and the highest risk catchments have been put first. So we've deemed they're ones that are high risk as where we um, there's either a designated site that is a poor status or um, already, or whether there's uh, already over abstraction that is thought in those catchments. Um, so um, if you have received your license already for, for those couple, then um, those are in high risk catchments. And the ones that we're going on to next for the next 18 months are on the low risk catchments. So um, if you haven't had yours next, then it's probably good news that you're in a low risk catchment and that it should take uh, be a quicker and easier process. I might just add to that, Louise, that um, um, I think make you know trying to ensure that the number of unknowns are minimised. So um, especially... Um, pumping rates and uh, getting some handle on your um, uh, on existing flow rates if you're certainly if you're looking at extensions to sites um, in, um, engage with the regulators early get um, get a scoping opinion so that you don't get any surprises coming out of the out of the woodwork at you uh, that so you can design your baseline so it's looking to identify or you're looking to explore um, the, um, the the interaction or the connectivity between the site and uh, and these receptors um, so that your evidence space is is as robust as possible, and that is likely to um, to reduce the uh, either the, the requests for additional data, which can be um, a real big delay, um, uh, and uh, and, and obviously provide an evidence base in, to um, be able to have confidence in your impact assessment, and if necessary, the mitigation approaches you're going to use to. Um, to address that impact. Thank you, Clive. Um, just a couple of um, scenario-based examples, stroke questions. Um, so, firstly, our old friend, the, um, the unlined silt lagoon that's in contact with, um, with groundwater, in continuity with groundwater, where you've got essentially dirty, silty water going in one end of a series of lagoons and clean water being taken from the other. When you're in continuity with, with the groundwater body, I've always been led to believe, and I may be completely wrong, hoping you can help, that that would be classed as passive dewatering as opposed to active. Um, there, clearly, there'll be times of the year where you've got seasonal losses from your silt, silt lagoon system to groundwater, and other times of the year where you'll actually be taking water uh, from the groundwater body. So that was example number one. Example number two, um, dredging, subwater table suction dredging, where effectively you're um, pumping a, a sandy slurry, if you like, uh, from the ground to your processing plant and taking water, groundwater with it along the way. Would that be classed as passive or active dewatering? The first one um, sounds like it was passive because it doesn't, it sounds like it's just a natural water table going up and down. Um, so in the first sort of situation, you're talking about not pumping it at all. You're just talking about like the natural variation of it, discharge it going. To, to ground and then coming up is that what you're talking about? So, 
a normal silt lagoon system, you have dirty water going in one end and then you take clean water out of the other end where you're yeah. in continuity with groundwater for, for the for mineral washing. So you would act, you know, be taking water from the ground for use in a process. Uh, but it's within the confines of a, a managed silt lagoon system. Yeah, that that's that, that that's common. Yeah, that, that that sounds like it's just passive dewatering. It's it's where it's going like into the sump in the first place about whether that activity, about whether you sort of creating the, the quarry void and then um like it, it coming to the face. If if that if there was like a, a private supply that was right next to that point, then um then you would normally have to do the assessment of whether that uh, that sort of obstruction or pot, like designated site or whatever was at risk. Um, and then there might be need some control over it, but if it's just a, a standard sort of transfer that thing, then no, it would not not normally require. It would normally fall under the uh, the terms of the the passive dewatering. Uh, the second one um, about pumping it out. Um, normally for dredging, um, normally that that if if you. If you're taking, it would depend on how much you're taking and over what period of time. It's most likely that uh, if if you're just sort of taking it, it, it might, uh, there's various different exemptions, but it, it might be licensable um, from, from, uh, from depending on where if you were taking from the source. Uh, certainly, you know, if, if if you're taking uh, from something that's in continuity with the groundwater, then uh, it wouldn't be if it's a if it's from a, a sort of a, maybe a line pond or anything like that. Then possibly not. Would, no, you, normally, not. would you normally do it from like the groundwater? Yeah, so subwater table mineral, typically a sand yeah. sand deposit where you you basically you're pumping it in suspension um, into your processing plant. So I know it might be fifty percent sand, fifty percent water, groundwater. Yeah. That that would yeah that would probably be licensable I would have thought. Okay, thank you. It might it might depend Rob where that water goes if 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 the water is returned to the same the same body. Then yeah, that, that, there it, may it, be an argument that actually you're returning the water balance, in, and you you know you're not lowering water levels, or if you can demonstrate you're not lowering water levels, then um, then there wouldn't be a groundwater dewatering impact, and there would be an argument I think that maybe it should be exempt but if that water was going elsewhere say off, off to a river or something then i think it probably would be for sure uh require an abstraction yeah if you're going to put it to your processing plant it's most likely that it would but yeah if yeah if it's just going to go back to the ground where you can sort of recirculate it then maybe not thank you sorry not a very clear cut answer for that one uh, there's one for both um diane and clive possibly we could go to diane first um if you could kind of point towards one aspect with the whole quarry dewatering process from you know, dewatering to then um, discharging with the new kind of uh, permitting regime coming in, would you say there's kind of one aspect which is the biggest risk to new licenses being granted? Not necessarily. I mean, I, I've not known any, certainly what, and none of, that I've done, and, and, and we've done some quite complex ones to date that have been unlicensable. I think it's more about that um, we've not been able to validate them because the um, of the, the the lack of evidence so the the monitoring um you know there wasn't enough monitoring um or the monitoring um was um not fully representative of the site so there was quite some quite uh, big extensions that i've done for some recently where they hadn't put uh there wasn't monitoring sites in the new phase and there were quite different geology um or you know um, um and understanding from from the two monitoring points from the from an our vast site that weren't quite representative enough so it was more of um you know if if if, some, if we'd had that discussion earlier we could have clearly sort of said you know you need to add some more monitoring points so you know um do a longer monitoring uh, duration um so that that it, it, it's just having having that evidence up front because i think that's the sort of the biggest frustration for us, but also for other people, where we we then sort of, you know, that's the worst thing where we're literally telling people where you need to come come back in like nine months a year, you know, once you've got that data. Um, I think it's what Clive said. You have to like almost prepare well in advance, particularly for monitoring boreholes, to get the get the replacements in, um, particularly on extensions. Um, 
So I think we're seeing more deepening now, certainly in my area in the north, uh, than than new sites or lateral extensions. So, um, so the, there's greater risks with deepening, and uh, I think um, that's a big sort of issue in that people aren't really understanding that maybe on previous uh, phases you might have had looked sort of receptors within maybe a kilometre but once you get to that deepening you might be looking at maybe five kilometres or and it's just that understanding of uh, you know people going away and you may like I guess get somebody to commission somebody to do some work and then we go in the air no, that's that's not good enough you know it's it's not to fully understand the risk I mean certainly from our perspective if you we know there's always in a risk based system uncertainties but we like we like certainty in the uncertainties so if you know spell it out and i think a lot of people don't do that and, and just say just say what you don't know because that's all lines of evidence because if you if you can't if it's just co- too costly or it's not feasible to get something then say that you've at least considered it because if we look at something and we'll go well, why didn't you consider that but you've already done it but ruled it out then you know we can't we can't guess that. So I think that's one of the biggest things from us that that um, we have to do a lot of guesswork, and then it gets frustrated where we go back and go, well, we we maybe if you do it particularly on planning, you might object to a planning application um, because of, because of a lack of information. Then it get, it's, people get frustrated, and then you go, well, we considered that, and it's like, well, you didn't tell us. So I think that's one of the things. Is it doesn't have to be a long section. You can even just do do bullets, but just. You know, if there's something that you've you've considered, but it's just not being feasible, or you discounted it, just put it somewhere in the document, and that, and I think that's that'll just cover it because I think that's one of the things is, you know, it's it's the, maybe it's the people's thought process, and, and but you know, it often gets. Five, how about yourself? Um, well, I mean, I think I said right at the beginning that I actually think that a lot of the the issue has is being dealt with, and it's being dealt with quite robustly and uh, planning already so so i mean i do think it's getting harder um but actually any planning application in the last 10 years will have had to put that baseline evidence base uh together and you wouldn't have got planning permission without it so um so i don't think it's i don't think the introduction of of the groundwater abstraction regime actually adds any more complexity other than another permitting process that you have to go through and of course that's therefore got that's fraught with delays and so clearly there's a cost and there's always a risk associated with that but from a technical point of view i actually think that the the you know the impact assessment is something that's being done anyway and and, and has been done for um uh for a considerable period of time and certainly you know the last decade or more um uh i think perhaps the you know the the bigger challenge is that uh you start to see a lot more civil society organizations getting themselves organized um uh the um you know there is a, a greater concern about you know, a lack of water and therefore if water is being moved about um even relatively small amounts then um, then the regulators are getting you know, more concerned about this, whereas previously the fact that dewatering was essentially non-consumptive meant that it, even if you were having an impact, there you have every there's every likelihood that you could mitigate that impact. Um, so, you know, I think it is becoming a slightly more, you know, it is getting a bit more tricky. But there's a but there is a, a raft of other water management issues that are increasing to that. Um, um, I mentioned briefly that the surface water discharge, surface water management, is is becoming much more regulated. You know, with the movement towards the recent movement towards uh, councils and the LLFAs, the local flood authorities taking responsibility for that. The reinterpretation in the recent years of having to manage total flows and i think that's actually a much more tricky issue uh and um and of and the the especially for the low-lying sites groundwater uh groundwater flooding is an issue caused by obviously you know, the placement of low permeability backfill with with recycling meaning that the perhaps there's a greater a greater amount of imported fill is likely to be low of low, lower permeability than it used to be, then then 
groundwater flooding risks, which are also an LNFA issue, um, they really start to kick up a stink with, with the local uh, with the local residents. So, I would say all of those were much greater rising challenges than what the groundwater abstraction um, or the, you know, the introduction of the groundwater abstraction regime um, presents as, as, a, as a new risk to your businesses. Great, thank you. I have a further question from Ian Brewer on the chat. Um, this is one for Diane. Is there any case where moving water within the site boundary within the same aquifer block would not require licensing? For example, if a pump into a recharge trent or to another extraction void? Uh, not if it was groundwater. You would still have to do the assessment, the risk assessment. So, unfortunately, there's a there was a there's an exemption for construction dewatering, but it's not. It was it's specific, which is would basically cover that issue, but it's. The legislation was clearly states that it's not applicable uh, or can't be used for for mineral sites, where it's basically where you take from one and then you immediately put back to the ground, which is exempt on construction sites. I don't know why that came, why they decided just construction sites rather than mineral sites, um, but uh, otherwise it would be it would come down to if it was pumping, then it would most likely require a license, and then it um, unless you could sort of it, it would most likely be a transfer license, um, which would be a sort of a, um, an initial sort of assessment but then no no continued assessments after that i think it's a proximity issue that um you know, if you have one void um and i think like, um, uh, rob mentioned it you know if you're if you're, if you're pump, pumping water out and it's going back it's essentially to the same void and therefore you, it, and therefore the impact on the surrounding environment is is negligible then then there might be some room for discussion if you're transferring it across a very large site to get that water away from your pit so you so the return of that water back to your pit is is reduced then clearly you create a dewatering impact around one pit and maybe a ground to recharge benefit or impact around another and i guess ultimately the point of the groundwater abstraction um, permitting approach is to ensure the management and mitigation of impacts to that water environment so if if you do create that impact then then the groundwater abstraction um, permitting is, is going to capture that activity um, if you fully mitigate that or, or well no if you, if you mitigate it maybe it's it's still caught by it but but if if there is no in impact then then maybe there's some uh, some room for discussion with the agency on, on the basis that you know, there's no net change and there's no impact on the external environment. Yeah, I mean, we, we have regulatory position statements um, for various activities which sort of fall into that. So if we do start getting a large number of sites, you know, then we would, you know, industries can, can sort of almost put the case forward. I know that's, you know, for, for example, the, the low risk dewatering, the passive dewatering position statement came out of uh, Network Rail putting like a case forward for, for many of its sites. And then I think other industries came in and sort of uh, said very similar. So I think that's, you know, if, if, if there's something activity that is low risk, um, then we do have, you know, regulatory position statements um, that basically mean that you won't have, wouldn't have to apply for a license. So, you know, if it's something as an industry that you're starting to see certain activities, which you do feel is low risk, um, uh, then, you know, you can always sort of, Somebody could come to us, and uh, when we can consider, you know, our national, um, our national uh, teams sort of who, who come up with these uh, statements can could consider consider it. So I know that certainly the first step that they did was to basically say instead of having multiple transfer licenses, then we, you know we have gone to this one one sort of um, license that covers all movements within the site, but it still would have have that license in the first place for that assessment to be made. But I think the, 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 the passive dewatering um, position statement, I think it's interesting because it it demonstrates that the regulators are willing to have a dialogue and are willing to make exemptions where where the where they consider the risk to be low. Um, so they're not. It's not a case of saying you can't have an impact. It's saying you can't. You know, you, it's the risk of that to something is what's relevant. So, so yeah, I, I think it's it's a very interesting development. That's that's occurred recently, 
and uh, maybe something that um, the, the uh, extractive industry should um, should start to look at. I mean, and, and that and that uh, RPS has actually been changed twice in the last year as the result of more people coming up with, with, with different scenarios that they think should fall under it. And, it, you know, we've changed the, the wording of it slightly slight, uh, slightly on tw- two occasions, uh, once in October and once in December last year. So I don't know everybody who's eagle-eyed who might have used it, who might have saw that change. But, uh, but you know, we, we do we do review them as well as, as uh, sort of new new um, sort of evidence comes in that, uh, of, of different sites that might want to fall under it. Okay, well, thank you very much to both the speakers. I think that was a fantastic presentation. We knew we were going to be challenged for time because it's a, a huge topic. And I think uh, you've both dealt with it very professionally and, and given a lot of thought to, to the information you've given to us. So we're very grateful to that. I think in particular, Diane, that your back page is extremely helpful. The number of times that we get something from the Environment Agency that just says, look on the EA website, and you, you go, where do I look? So that, that's great. And again, Clive, thank you very much for the practical guidance. That, that I'm sure, has given a lot of people um, some thoughts in terms of what they can do to improve matters and perhaps better ways of monitoring and some lessons that um, you've learned along the way will help as well. Um, I think uh, going forward, hopefully, uh, with this sort of almost twin regulation, it's going to make planning difficult. But uh, as Clive has said, there's, there's going to be other challenges that are going to come in, and I think the quarry industry is, is well used to taking whatever it gets thrown at it. So we'll we'll just deal with it and get on. So thank you very much to both speakers.